So again, I'm E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are also the school store partner for Agnes Scott College. And Agnes Scott College is one of our partners for this special event today. We're delighted to welcome Rafael Ocasio, Angela Angie L. Willis, and Sandro R. Barros for a discussion of the dissidents of Reynaldo Arenas Queering Literature, Politics, and the Activist Curriculum. We are so glad to see so many of you already in the chat, and we welcome you to continue to say hello and shout out where you're watching from. You can also ask questions at any time in the chat or in the Ask a Question button tab down at the bottom center of the screen. And I'll introduce uh, Rafael Ocasio first. He is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Spanish at Agnes Scott College and is the author of two books on dissident writer Renaldo Arenas, Cuba's Political and Sexual Outlaw, and The Making of a Gay Activist. His other books include Latin American Culture and Literature, Afro-Cuban Costumbriso. I apologize, I am not a Spanish speaker um, and I my accent is not good, so feel free to correct me when you come on. Um, From Plantations to the Slums, the Bristol, Rhode Island, and Matanza's Cuba Slavery Connection, The Diary of George Howe, as well as Race and Nation in Puerto Rican Folklore, Franz Boaz and John Alden Mason in Puerto Rico, and most recently, Folk Stories from the Hills of Puerto Rico, um, which we just celebrated earlier last year. So welcome, Rafa. We're also joined by Angie L. Willis, who is Professor of Hispanic Studies and Latin American Studies at Davidson College. Her scholarship centers on transatlantic, transtemporal intertextualities, specifically between inquisitorial Spain and revolutionary Cuba. She's especially fascinated by transgressive texts, by the underdogs and rebels of literature, and by the notion of writing as a means of escape and survival. Angie is the author of several articles on Cuban literature and is the co-author of the book that we are celebrating today. She is currently completing a second monograph centered on the notion of homosexual rewriting of canonical texts from the Hispanic cultural tradition and Renaldo Arenas' narrative. She was awarded the Sturgis Levitt Award of Cicolas, which is Southeastern Council on Latin American Studies, her best article published by members in 2005. Additionally, she is past president of Cicolas, an organization in which she has also served in many other leadership capacities. And last but not least, Sandro Barros, his research interests focus on broad issues connected with multilingual development, culture, and language politics in K-16 through curricula. He is interested in how the study of languages other than English shapes the public's perception of citizenship and belonging within the co context of the nation state. He analyzes the connections between ideologies of language learning and how they support truth regimes that influence multilingual pedagogy discourse, how do intellectuals and policymakers exercise their institutional power to influence public thought in the name of the common good, how do second language pedagogy discourses reinforce monolingual ideologies, and how do they assist us in cultivating linguistic diversity? So I am sure some of those questions we've brought to bear today on our discussion, which is exciting. And um, we're delighted, you know, Keras is a, is a space of many queer texts, so we're really excited um, to be bringing in this queer text with all of you today. Um, so we'll go ahead and unmute and make sure everybody is good to go before I leave the screen. I'm gonna unmute you, Rafa. Um, let's test yours as well, Angie, and I think we should be all set. All right. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. It is truly a delight to have you and to, to know about this great book. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, ER, and your amazing team for hosting us today. And thank you to all the guests who have taken time out of this Friday, hopefully beautiful Friday, wherever you are, to have your lunch with us. I'd like to give a little special shout out to Kara Evanson, Davidson College librarian extraordinaire, who I think is joining us today, who supported our research in countless ways and without whom our book would have been not the same. Before we begin today, we should pause to note that it is not only April 1st, April Fool's Day, uh, as we come together to talk and learn more about Reynaldo Arenas. It seems so incredibly appropriate as so much of his brilliance and fame as a writer stems from his playful, frequently parodic texts that reveal an author who found salvation even in the most complicated and trying of circumstances in ludic, sometimes even outrageous, humorous texts. 
Arenas' sardonic novels also showcase the famous Cuban uh, choteo. On a more serious note, April 1 is also a special day historically for Cubans, as it marks the beginning of the Mario boat lift, the mass exodus that began on April 1, 1980, when a bus driver crashed his bus into the Peruvian embassy seeking asylum. That act would result in 125,000 Cubans fleeing Castro's dictatorship between April and October of 1980 in what would become one of the most massive migrations in our history. Amongst those fleeing masses was a then 37-year-old Reynaldo Arenas. Today's, today's connection to the Mariel Exodus is of additional poetic significance for our conversation today, as Arenas was fascinated and troubled by the notion of the repetition of historical cycles, by history's seemingly relentless marginalization of peoples, by forced migration, flight, or the search for an ever elusive escapatoria or escape from dictatorship, oppression, war, and intolerance. So as we pause for a moment to recall Arenas's forced migration, along with that of his fellow Marielitos, we'd also like to pay our respects to the Ukrainian people and for other displaced and oppressed individuals around the world and throughout history. Thank you again, uh, ER and your team for hosting us and for your guests uh, who are here today. And we look forward to talking to you more. Rafa. Good afternoon. My name is Rafa. Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Casio. My pronouns are he, his, and him. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the official book release of Reynaldo Arenas Queering Literature and Activist Curriculum, University of Florida, 2022. On behalf of my colleagues, Angela Willis at Davidson College and Sandro Barros at Michigan State University, many thanks to Keris for hosting this event and to all of our friends, colleagues, and students for joining us today. We have agreed to take some seven minutes each to highlight an aspect of our book followed by one question we will ask ourselves about our experience writing this book on such a, an iconic personality, and certainly we will be happy to take your own questions. Although the recent public upheaval against the revolutionary government in Cuba beginning in July of 2021 is of outstanding historical importance, I am reminded of an earlier revolutionary of early revolutionary demos that started on April 1st, 1980, when a bus driver crashed his vehicle into the Peruvian embassy in Havana. The chaos that followed led thousands of individuals to seek asylum at the embassy. As the numbers of protesters increased to unimaginable numbers, they too were negatively categorized as undesirables eventually forcing the Cuban government to allow them to abandon the island. Between April 15 and October 31, huge mass visuals seeking status refugees reached Florida through the Mariel boat lift. It provided that for undesirables and antisocials, amongst them homosexuals, referred to as escoria, scum, by the Cuban regime. Among those near 125,000 Marielitos was Reynaldo Arenas, 1942-1990. Arenas arrived in Key West on May 5, 1980, where he was processed at the Truman Annex of the U.S. Naval Facilities. He was penniless, and like his fellow Marielito refugees, he had been stripped of his material possession, including his literary work in progress. In spite of his strong international reputation, particularly in France, where three of his novels published in French had received high critical acclaim, Arenas arrived not as an internationally known intellectual seeking freedom of expression, but as a homosexual with a criminal record. The U.S. American newspaper reporter Marlis Simon, writing 
from Havana for the Washington Post on May reported Arenas's arrival in the United States as a writer, quote, a jail sentence for a homosexual offense, end of Simmons also stated that Arenas barely escaped the Cuban authority once he was discovered had been attempting to leave the island under a pseudonym. Controversially, Simmons' outing of Arenas might have inspired Arenas himself to do the same as part of a queer counter narrative. Upon his arrival in the United States, Arenas frequently made public anti-revolutionary statements, soon becoming known as the most vocal and most feared of Cuban exiled writers. Arenas also took upon himself the plight of the common Marielito refugee, perhaps because his own criminal record and his humble origins as a peasant allowed him to align himself with the underdog refugees. Since 10 years in exile, Arenas maintained an act role as organizer of boycotts against the Castro regime in national and international campaigns, and he often provided funds for their public promotion. This was an, academic, this was an economic sacrifice because he was living in modest conditions in shotgun apartments in New York City's Hell's Kitchen. He worked on manuscripts smuggled out of Cuba of stories and novels characterized by highly eroticized plots that had been censored by the official Cuban publishing establishment. This production was intended to complement his political writings, bringing together political and sexual activism as agents of social change. He continued to engage in sexual relations, considered taboo, and his preference for sexual activities in public, in public spaces and unprotected sex was fully documented in his autobiography and in his private correspondence. Ultimately, as a self-promoted queer and Marielito writer, Arenas displayed no fear that his over-homosexualized over literary activism could result in failure to attain financial success as it partially did. His outlandish behavior, whether at the personal level, as in his many confrontations with dissenting critics, or in his highly eroticized literary explorations, embody the public image of a fearless activist, an overwhelming role that so many of his surviving friends and foes still remember him by today. This would become the most radical figure of an emerging cohort of Latino, Latinx, and Latin Americans in the United States, a mentorship role that has yet to be surpassed in intensity and in, and in its rawness of expressions. Because of advanced AIDS, Arenas committed suicide on 7, 1990. You can go ahead. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you. So after this introduction, <laughs> hi, everybody. It's the weirdest thing to do this online. So I'll just pretend that I have folks here and friendly folks in front of me and talk from there. From there, So, you know, a space of imagination, very much like Arenas' own uh, unrestrained freedom. So I think at this point, um, after this, this small introduction, it's important for us to talk a little bit about the genesis of, of a... Uh, of this book. The three of us come from uh, sort of a interrelated but sort of different uh, disciplinary interests as well. And so we cut, cut across a lot of things. And my end of, of things is about education. And I came to Reynaldo Arenas um, uh, after actually reading uh, Rafael Ocasio's book um, on, on, uh, on, on his, uh, you know, his, his, his work on, on Reynaldo Arenas. And I remember being deeply moved uh, by it uh, for, for its incisive uh, sort of historiographic work uh, on, on Arenas's, uh, uh, you know, uh, affairs. 
And at that point, I was very much interested in autobiographical uh, approaches to, 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 to literature and the curriculum, specifically, you know, those who have been adapted to the screen. And before Night Falls at the time was, you know, going to compete in the Oscars for, I think it was if, best director. And I don't know, I don't think it was best film. And so um, I... I, it was just a series of, for, through a series of coincidences, I met, uh, you know, uh, Rafael Ocasio um, during a posse uh, meeting that we were both in, involved and, uh, and then we exchanged a few words and kind of this desire to talk about um, uh, Reynaldo Arenas and re-encounter, uh, re meet Reynaldo Arenas again was kind of rekindled uh, in that occasion. So for me, coming to the Reynaldo Arenas and writing this book again was a, actually to more um, specifically deal with Arenas as, as a public pedagogue and the, the, the figure of Arenas as a public pedagogue and, and an author that to this date has haunted me. Um, so coming back to this project and kind of reigniting how can we think about Reynaldo Arenas as, uh, as, as, a, as a public intellectual, as a public pedagogue, and how can we think about his uh, literature as a curriculum was something that sort of like um, came quite organically uh, and, uh, and emerged from surface from our conversations during the pandemic. You know, the gestation of this book came in the pandemic. So for me, coming to Arenas was sort of like a return to a theme, to an author that I think has much to offer to to the educational discipline, particularly in how we theorize the, the historical curriculum, which I'm going to be talking a little bit, uh, you know, afterwards. Uh, so yes, and I've, uh, so now I would like my colleagues to speak about this, you know, how they came to Arenas. So hi again, everyone. Um, in terms of how I first encountered Renato Arenas, I was in a grad school class on historiography with Cesar Sagado at the University of Texas at Austin. And I read this novel that was a rewrite of an 18th century uh, uh, religious man, Fray Servando Teresa de Mier, and um, how he Arenas took his autobiography, his memoirs, and rewrote them in a fictionalized fashion. And that first encounter with El Mundo Alucinante, which was one of Arenas' first novels, led me in this inter intertextual journey uh, to many other texts. So I began very early on to think of Arenas as a teacher of sort in that he led me on intellectual uh, literary um, uh, odysseys, if you will, of the mind into all different kinds of places and spaces and one text inevitably led to another, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of this particular book, I, I like Sandra really have to give a shout out to Rafa as well who I met at one of my very first academic conferences. And he was the guy who came up after the conference and said, wow, that's really interesting what you're doing. I have some ideas and some sources and let me send you these things. And there you are thinking, oh, I'll never hear from this person again. He was really nice, but, and a week later, there's a package in my mail and he had sent these things to me. And I, then we started working together with conferences, book reviews, um, conversations, uh, et cetera. And it's a relationship that has grown year after year. And so again, like Sandro, I have to really give Rafa credit for having had the idea for this book and for inviting both me and Sandro to collaborate. Um, as Sandro said, we've only actually, or mentioned or insinuated, we wrote the project during the pandemic. And so we've only actually all been together in person once for one conference, March of 2020, right before COVID hit. And so um, for me, this project was also a salvation of sorts and an intellectual space to work and to thrive and to have a mentorship and collaboration. And um, I think we've all found that Arenas keeps speaking to us in different ways and different moments of our lives. And we may come back to that point later, but I'd like to hear uh, from our mentor, Rafa, about his experience. Thank you. you. You're too kind. Um, um, I, I guess one of the joys of um, being an older uh, scholar, um, I, I have had the pleasure to meeting people like um, Angie and um, Sandro um, throughout my career. And uh, this is the most exciting part of being a scholar. You can share your knowledge with others. Um, the To, to answer, um, Sandro's 
question. Um, I guess because of my age, uh, of the three of us, I am obviously the older. I do remember the first time uh, Reynaldo Arenas uh, presented um, as, as a Marielito. Um, I was in, um, I was a junior, I guess, um, my third year at the University of Puerto Rico. And um, he came to um, Puerto Rico often, um, mainly because he was crazy about the ocean. If you know anything about Renaldo, he loved the beach. And um, because of his particular um, political status as a Marielito, the first years he couldn't travel uh, abroad. So he made Puerto Rico his abroad um, connection. Um, and um, I was at, was at his um, presentation in 1981, as I said, um, where he presented himself as very vocal um, Marielito um, refugee. Many years later, when I was in grad school, I rediscovered him through the same novel that Angie um, also um, discovered him, um, El Mundo Alucinante, um, The hallucinate, ha Hallucinatory World, um, which is a biography of a um, incredible um, priest, Mexican priest who in the early part of the 19th century denied the existence of the apparition of God and um, started that theory that indeed it was not um, an apparition, but um, a reinterpretation of a um, goddess, uh, of an Aztec goddess for which he was persecuted by the, by the Spanish Inquisition. Um, so I, I guess to wrap things up, um, I was also, because being the older um, scholar, I also was impressed by his um, presentation of homoerotic um, descriptions in the novel. This, that the novel was written in the 1960s, and um, there were not that many um, images of homoeroticism in Latin American lit at that time. Thank you, Rafa, for sharing that with us. Um, as we're talking about books and performance and public access uh, as, as pedagogy and, and discourse, it's so important to hear from you. Um, one of the questions that we ask in our book is why Arenas today? Why is he so relevant? So something that I would like to share, I'm gonna read just a few more minutes as part of a promotional piece that I recently published with the university, I'm sorry, with the Florida Bookshelf uh, which again was a promotional piece for this book. And um, this piece discusses continuities of Cuban dissidents and how Arenas's life and work continue inspiring dissidents, artists, queer folks, and other marginalized persons. On November 17th, 17th 2021, Cuban dramatist, activist, and founder of the online group Archipelago, which as of today, I just checked, has 38,000 members on Facebook. A junior Garcia Aguilar fled the island to seek exile as Arenas had done before him. Arenas and, I'm sorry, Aguilar and his family uh, had become targets of ongoing harassment and so they fled to Spain. According to Garcia Aguilar in the press conference that he held uh, from Madrid on November the 18th, he'd essentially been made a prisoner of his own home for his artistic and political dissidents for more than a year while repeatedly attempting to engage in a peaceful dialogue with Cuban authorities. In his first remarks at the press conference, after expressing his firm belief that one can learn more about a country and its people by studying its artistic production, something that uh, Arenas uh, asserted once and again in his work, blur and lot, Blurred Lines Between Fiction and Reality, um, Garcia Aguilar compared the Cuban Revolution's oppressive actions to, and I quote, an abusive husband with his own people. Garcia Aguilar then recalled how in the early years of the revolution, Fidel Castro had reportedly pronounced that it should, quote, not eat its children as the mythological god Saturn had done. He quipped though how now the Cuban revolution was not only cannibalizing its offspring, but quote, it was devouring its grandchildren. Garcia Aguilar also directly referred to earlier Cuban dissident writers, Reynaldo Arenas, Jose Lazama Lima, and Virgilio Pineda, 
describing how they had inspired him to stand up to oppression. Quote, when I became cognizant of the reality of Cuba, thanks to reading authors like Reynaldo Arenas, Lesama Lima, and Virgilio Piñera, I understood that my voice had to denounce what was happening in Cuba. Our book departs from this very premise. Reynaldo Arenas' life, writing, and death have served as a pedagogical model for fellow dissidents and marginalized peoples to emulate. Our work likewise examines the relationship between Arenas and his mentors, some mentioned by Garcia Aguilar, whose lives, writing, and even deaths inspired by Arenas, just as, had, as he would become a public pedagogue for fellow Cubans to come. Our book explores how Arenas' creative work, pedagogical activism as a Marielito, and life as a sexually marginalized individual continues reaching dissidents in Cuba and beyond. In the last letter composed by Arenas, his suicide note, which also was published as the last chapter of his autobiography, Before Night Falls, he blames Castro for his misfortunes, for his exile, and for even for his AIDS. In the letter, he stresses the importance of writing as a way of fortifying one's own legacy, of speaking the truth fearlessly, no matter the cost. Arenas penned these words, quote, I want to encourage the Cuban people out of the country, as well as those on the island, to continue fighting for freedom. Cuba will be free. I already am. Arenas' assertion that Cuba will be free was again recently echoed at the Latin Grammys by the wildly popular Cuban musical group, movement, and song, all of the same name, Patria y Vida, Homeland and Life, who bravely also call for Una Cuba Libre. While Arenas' wishes for a Cuba Libre have not yet been realized, contemporary artists such as Junior Garcia Aguilar and the members of Patria Vida have taken up the struggle, moved to action by the pedagogical model of dissidents so bravely embodied by the life and work of Arenas. One final note, just this morning as I was reading the New York Times, I saw an article about the legislation being passed in Florida, which will make it illegal for teachers to discuss sexual orientation from elementary age children, the so-called don't say gay laws. And I could not help but wonder if I was in a nightmarish time machine of sorts. And I also could not help but ask what Arenas would say. How would he write this historical episode? His message of speaking our truth and acts of dissidence in the face of oppression continue reverberating. Thank you. Um, Sandra? Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I think if it's something that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Angela touches that, uh, that, you know, uh, speaks directly to the kind of curriculum that Arenas imagined, uh, it was this notion of the cyclical time, these returns of, of these eternal returns of, uh, of these nightmarish scenarios. Um, you know, nowadays we're talking about refugees and we're talking about Marielitos and we're talking about refugees. And of course, refugees have always been a constant in our history, um, especially evading, you know, instances of oppression and so forth. But what, I, what I, wanted, I wanted to tackle here a little bit today is why should we, I mean, should we? can do whatever you want, but why to read Arenas' curriculum as, as uh, Arenas' literature as a curriculum? And what do we mean uh, precisely by his pedagogy of dissidence? I think that one thing that struck us and strikes any, I think, a reader of Arenas' is, is how cohesive his literature is, how his message is constant, constantly uh, right on point. You know, it's like if he were ever um, more uh, diplomatic, uh, he would be an awesome politician, you know, because he's constantly on key, on the same key, on the same message, freedom at any cost, you know, freedom from oppression, and not only physical oppression, but mental oppression as well. What kinds of systems of thoughts, um, sort of, a, and truth claims, uh, sort of close our imagination to what is possible to think about it, uh, about the world. And so in, in his uh, literature, one sees this constant criticism towards right and left absur absurds, absurdities, you know? His constant critique, and it's also something that uh, perhaps isolated him, and, and it's perhaps something that uh, prevented him from being more well-known to the world, to the United States, than he actually was outside Hispanic circles and outside, um, let's say, this connoisseur uh, culture. 
So when we propose a reading of Arenas as a curriculum, we are talking about several things. Number one is, of course, this cohesion, this series of subjects to study that present a form of rehistoricized version of the Cuban revolution that pleases nobody because it doesn't spare anybody, including himself. In some occasions, he does not come, uh, 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 you know, as necessarily as a pleasant individual, but that sardonic parisiastis, uh, pedagogue, that, that fearless speech sort of person that I know that this is going to hurt me, but I'm going to speak my truth no matter what. And I will do it as, as strategically as possible. So in that sense, we read his uh, um, his his entire oeuvre uh, throughout the book, uh, paying a key and attention to uh, this this uh, this cohesive aspect of his literature, this drive to rehistoricize and to blur the lines between uh, fiction and fact, and to question and challenge even because of the self-referentiality of his, his, his novels and his writings. Um, you know, we, we can constantly be tracked. Wait a second. Is this, is, is, is this really him speaking in there? No, it's not. It's a fictionalized version. Say, but what version of self is not fictional once we present it to the public? So he's really calling our attention to a myriad of, uh, of, of issues that we discuss um, when we talk about sanctioned knowledge. So that's one thing. And another thing that we found interesting in our readings of Arenas' curriculum is how he brings to bear this sort of phenomenological narrative of the, 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 of, of the Cuban revolution and its characters um, and, and the life worlds that he inhabits, where, whether as when he became a refugee or when he was back um, in, uh, in the island. And this is uh, something that is interesting because it, it's sort of an exploration of individuals' life worlds, you know, uh, how people perceive reality, but it, it doesn't make necessarily representational claims and saying this is somebody else's truth according to the science of the time, you know, that's literature. Uh, but what he does is very much sublimate this universe of desire. Who has the desire to tell the truth here? And what is this desire of tell, telling the truth? Castro, his truth, his, other people's truths is bringing to the fore. Is, 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 is making visible to us of how power really works and how political power is work and how words and especially literature in his case can contest and have the power to even being lies and fabri fabrications actually blur this line between fiction. And he proposes something very powerful in this curriculum, which is that fiction is not necessarily that which stands in opposition to the truth, but a fiction is a modality of truth telling. Uh, perhaps truths that are too ineffable, perhaps truths that are difficult to digest, perhaps perhaps other kinds of uh, of truth that are not imposing themselves as as a, as, as the true with a ca the, the truth with capital uh, capital C. So in that drive, Arenas proposes a very interesting anti-colonial project for knowledge, understanding knowledge as well. At least that's a, a reading that we can make uh, out of his, his works. It's a reading that tells us about the multiplicity uh, of knowledge, where knowledge emanates, and also this idea, this challenge to this sort of like linear way of perceiving life and perceiving the world, you know, with seeking origins and definite answers to things or totalitarian pictures. I think that we, we, we could say that uh, to, anti-totalitarianism is not the same as saying the totality, right? Because any cosmology, any kind of uh, uh, like religion or anything will have this idea, even science, you know, strives for totality. But uh, we, what he was about is not so much as against totality, his, but a totalitarian, a sort of like um, impositional truth, you no? Know? And what it means. So built within this curriculum, of course, there is a powerful pedagogy, a powerful um, way, a sensibility towards teaching about life that blends life, texts, human and non-human, animals and everything, all together desiring to construct the world. You know, Those who read his autobiography, for instance, uh, will notice his relationship with nature uh, as something curious that piques our curiosity to say, like, what, what does it mean here? Is it a inversion for those who come from education and are more or less familiar with with Rousseau's Emile, which is like this treaty of, uh, you know, how the child becomes educated in nature and so forth. We'll find the echoes of that in, in Reynaldo Arenas' work as well. But of course, in a very subversive and very, let's say, 
personal as opposed to the kind of like totalitarian so social sort of overarching um, account. So in his pedagogy of, 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 of dissidents, we find uh, this formulation, if every communicative, uh, that every communicative act is a pedagogical act, that every attempt that we have to communicate something of our inner world to somebody else has something pedagogical about it. Uh, and what this pedagogy tells us, uh, you know, um, it, about our attention and how we we place this attention and how we divide this attention. And for him, it was, again, this issue of being on key and on message and on point that we find fascinating. So coming to Arenas as a public pedagogue, in other words, somebody that through his testimonial accounts uh, teaches us aspects uh, of, 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 of the revolution and also through his his fiction that tells us, teaches us things about the revolution that otherwise we wouldn't think about or wouldn't kind of conceive. So his, his sardonic at times criticism, his self as a parisiastis really um, uh, has something to teach us about, uh, about the essence of his pedagogy and something that we need to discuss as well. That's something that curriculum scholars have a, a lot to gain from when we discuss what history is. So, yeah. And... So I think we... Um, yeah. Rafa. Adelante. Same? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Sandro. Um, like to give, we would like to give um, our dear audience post their questions. Otherwise, we continue. And I'm not really sure. But what? Um, sure the can the audience ask questions or they write? have to write the questions? ER. The, the audience is invited to write questions in the chat or in the ask a question box, but they can't vocalize the questions. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions yes. from the audience? Have we provoked you at all we <laughs> to think about things? I don't think there's any yet, but keep, oh, it looks like one just popped up. Um, so Christine, Christine Haynes oh. asks, could you please talk about the structure of the book and also tell us about how you wrote it collaboratively? Okay, that's that's an awesome question. Uh, that's yeah. that's a very good question. That I, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know if, if we could say I I can perhaps talk a little bit about this. That, that is perhaps. Go ahead, Rafa. Or not. Sandro, take it away. Rafa. Uh, oh, okay, ahead, Rafa, go ahead. Are you are you present? <laughs> I don't know. Rafa is like this is a seance. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it is a, a seance. It is a seance. Rafa, oh. are you present? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wanted to. Say, I wanted to say. I wanted to say this. Perhaps the most important part of our project. Um, from day one, we had decided to make this book collaboratively. So um, one of the one of the ways that we visually decided to do that or to communicate our reader um, that decision is that you will see that none of the chapters are signed individually. So all of the all of the chapters were written collaboratively. Thanks to our guru known as Sandro, we um, did this um, book on Google Doc as opposed to what Angie and I had in mind <laughs> to be writing pieces uh, on Word and uh, email the, the individual files. Uh, so we, we learned, I, the dinosaur of the crew, learned a lot of that technology through, through the magic of Sandro and Google Doc. Um, and um, um, I will let, my colleagues experience um, doing that. However, what I want to stress is that none of us as the rest of the world imagined what was going to happen in March of two years ago. We started writing this uh, book at the heart of the uh, pandemic. 
in my case, I was I was in Puerto Rico for spring break, and um, as soon as the college went online, I decided to stay. One, over that six months later, and I was still in. So a, a good chunk of um, contribution to this book, literally out of what I remembered. Um, um, from my previous experience writing two books on Renaldo, that was a crazy um, experience. That was the one point I wanted. But personally, what me more to writing this book during the peak of the pandemic was my constant reminding me that I had lived a pandemic like that, and that was the AIDS pandemic. I was a young guy in, in the 80s, and I remember so distinctively everything that we were reliving through, the, through this pandemic. Where is this coming from? Who is um, giving us this disease? Um, can we trust the doctors? Um, and um, it was a feeling um, unlike anything I have um, felt before, because um, um, at the peak of AIDS pandemic, I was not um, writing. So um, writing about AIDS was not my concern. My concern, my concern back then was just to keep alive. Um, very much like that was my concern during the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic. You know, I wanted to stay alive for my. Yeah. And, and it, if, if I may address the, the, the issue of the structure. So um, one of the, the issues of, for those who are familiar with the losing Atari and how they wrote for us was like that, sort of like you go there, nobody's below, the, te the text doesn't belong to anybody. You just go there and finish at somebody else's sentence. You add and you move things around and which creates kind of like a fun methodological, I think, uh, uh, process in which we kind of like go crazy and go back to the history of the document and everything is there who changed what and when who disappeared with what and why it was a, a hilarious process like that the, the question of the structure of the book is so we ended up with um you know the introduction and and six chapters right total um it, basically tackling different issues the different aspects of Arenas's uh, uh, work mine were more theoretically based. In other words, I'm, uh, I'm a student of education. Um, so I'm very interested in looking at life, literature, and texts as educative opportunities, right? As educative events. Um, and I tend to be very uh, theoretical, which was very nice because my colleagues were like, okay, can you ground it a little bit in more concrete examples? You know, and so that was very interesting for me as a learning experience of somebody who likes theory to think a little bit more um, theory grounded or theory, literary theory from the ground. So my chapters specifically deal with curriculum and pedagogy um, from a more theoretical aspect. And I think Angie's um, and, and uh, Rafa uh, taking into account aspects of curriculum and pedagogy that they wanted to single out. I think uh, Angie's, uh, the, the sexual economies, for instance, in, 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 and she can talk about it. I hate talking about it. You know? But anyways, and Rafa, of course, uh, um, historiographic, work that he's famous you know for doing that kind of historiographical and and you a little bit of the literary analysis and me the theoretical um, aspect of it so it was coming in and out of this um so for us at least collaborative so the structure of the book is that uh, chapter one we offer a particular in, um, an overall introduction to the work uh, discussing we write also very personally about coming to arenas then you know second chapter curriculum and well i'm, I'm changing the orders a little bit but then the, the remaining chapters are study case studies of aspects of arenas's pedagogy and curriculum that interested us to highlight yeah yeah just adding a little bit more um like they've said, Christine, it was a super fun process. I think we all started off very cautious. Um, again, Sandro and I did not know each other before the process began. Uh, we knew each other through Rafa, so we were very cautious and respectful. And do you mind if I put a comma? And by the end, we were taking out, moving. This sucks. Let's throw this Love out. It, yes. Um, I mean, 
It didn't suck. It was all amazing. But something really, really great that came out of the process was that, um, again, when at this point in our careers do you usually have two editors who are, are, are being so honest with you and so forth, but it's such a long process. And our reviewers consistently said that they felt like we had achieved our goal of the chapters feeling like they came from one voice. Now, Sanjo just revealed that, of course, we did have our preferred disciplinary approaches, our chapters that we wanted to write. We each wrote two chapters, but they were heavily edited by each other. Um, the collaborative process was interesting, having three people, all the wonderful things that come out of it. It's also complicated, right? One person's on vacation or one person's you know, <laughs> helping a sick child or whatever. So the process is slower, but it was also a really enriching process uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, the chapters that I focused on, as, as Sandra were, was talking a little bit, we're focused more on specific mentoring relationships and something that we haven't said yet said yet for uh, people in the audience who may be adding as scholars we included a lot of archival letters uh, archival manuscript references um, that shed some new light on some of the relationships that arenas had with for example one with with juan goitisolo a spanish writer who was really well known um, so we look at some of the international transatlantic relationships between uh, different dissident communities. Something else that's interesting to know, Arenas had a relationship with uh, Nestor Almendros, who uh, besides producing a really important documentary on uh, queers under Castro, um, he also uh, did the Blue Lagoon, uh, Kramer versus Kramer. He was a very important uh, cinematographer of the time and he also was in Arenas's friend group. We have a picture of them in the book of them at Thanksgiving together. Actually, no, Almendros took the picture. He's not in the picture, but he was outside the frame. Uh, he also succumbed and died of AIDS. So um, again, I think the primary text, the, the, the archival work that uh, we were able to do over the years also was reflected. Yeah. That's just a few more points that I wanted to add. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, and I think we managed to love each other more by the end, yeah. which is very interesting. You know, I think that the relationship, at least to me, it feels more like, I, I, Raf, of course, because I think he mentions that he's the oldest, but I don't see him that old. But it's just a, my, uh, the relationship here is definitely of teacher and student. <laughs> so I always consider myself a, a, a student of both. Um, uh, Rafa and Angie, because uh, they they are specialists in arenas. You know, I am the fan that gets to tag along and kind of put my weird ideas in there and say, "Hey, how about doing this?" But I think that that's uh, that's something you know, uh, sort of like that moved us. That's, you okay, know. Uh, crew. Thank you, Sandra. We have a few more questions yeah. here. Um, we have one from Kara. I'll read the question. How did the process of researching and writing this book affect how you will teach Arenas and see his work? I'm sorry, see Arenas and, and his work and how you'll teach him and his work to students in the future? Great question. So I'll ask my colleague. Rafa, you want to take this one? Right. That's, that's a good question. That's a good, that's a good question, Kara. I can honestly tell you that I've done one independent study but I have not taught um, Reynaldo Arenas as a subject in my literature classes. Um, and I think writing this book has given me the, um, has, has given me an idea, two or three, about what I want to do um, next. Unlike Sandro and um, Angie, as I've been seeing them on my way out. I know that um, I would be from Agnes Scott. Um, I think what I want to um, leave um, my students with is um, how how brave this man was. This man could have been at the international level of, of Gabriel Garcia Marquez or any of the uh, boom writers. As a matter of fact, I, I did not uh, mark it. I mentioned in passing that three of his books had been written, uh, had been translated into France and had won uh, international prizes. 
one of the international prizes that he won in um, France happened at the same year that uh, El Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Salute had been translated to France, went to Reynaldo Arenas, not to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Rafa, you're cutting out. So I know I'm not. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, I know that I'm not answering your question, uh, but um, I want I want that to be the tribute of Reynaldo, a brave man. Yeah, I have you? had the opportunity to teach. Angie, oh, sorry, Sandra? I have had the oh, Sandra. No, Angie. That's what I say. Oh, Angie, take it. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I've had the opportunity to teach um, his autobiography, which is hard. It's a hard read. Um, as I was just sharing with a student yesterday who's really interested in reading it uh, on her own, it's a hard read. We have to remember that he was writing it when he was dying, and um, he let it all hang out. All the things that he wanted to say, all the last-minute revenges he wanted to take, any confessions he wanted to, ta uh, to make, uh, it's painful to read. Um, that's a hard read. So when I taught that book, I have to prepare my students. I've also had the opportunity to teach his first novel, Celestino Antes del Alba, and some of the short stories. Um, the way that I've gone about it is to have them see the movie first or concurrently or around the same time because it's a lighter version of his life story. Um, we talk a lot about dissidents. We talk a lot about contemporary oppression, which I think is a really important way of contextualizing. Um, his writing, um, but again, it's 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 painful for me and I think for the students to see that humans are kind of stupid and we keep repeating the same mistakes. And before I finish, and then I'm gonna be quiet and let Sandra finish up, I saw a question from Tomas too about humor and how humor is a tool. And there's absolutely no doubt that uh, one of the things that he does is create these just outrageous um impossibly grotesque sometimes situations um, but they're funny it's like inappropriate humor a lot of times um so i don't know that I necessarily want to cite specific examples right now but um through these impossible situations uh he still was able to yeah. find humor sandra i don't know if you want to help me out with something maybe from color de verano yeah, well, yeah, the most enthusiastic, yeah. I think, uh, uh, work uh, of his is uh, El Color del Verano, The, the Color of Summer, uh, in English. Uh, a difficult ta text if you don't have that kind of sensibility that uh, it's very much in Latin America, that crass kind of humor, you know, that like in your face, aggressive. But, you know, in revisiting these themes of aggressive uh, aggression, uh, what, what what struck to me is like what I didn't, you know, how my life changed after this project and changed a lot. It reminded me that I am fundamentally a, a scholar of, of the educational humanities, something I was forgetting myself because I'm in a, in a college of education where education has become, tr its treatment has become that of a social science. And it reminded me of the artful. It reminded me of the playful, talking about humor. And in that sense, as I was reminded as writing with you all, um, it reminded me of who I really am in terms of as, as a personality, as a scholar. And also it reminded me of the sense of possibilities to opening education to these kinds of texts and talking about pedagogy and talking about curriculum, uh, not looking at social sciences and closing to social sciences materials exclusively and the perspectives of social science and that kind of, um, you know, where is your literature review, you know? And then from the literature review, that's how, you know, you come to interpret the world, you know, or you, you nod to that. But actually going back to the primary text, you know, which we humanities folks do, that's primary text is our business. I mean, we may bring other uh, 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 uh insights from other authors, but our focus is primarily on the primary text. And that's what distinguishes, I think, the humanities from other disciplines. You know, we may nod to some critical uh, discussion mm -hmm. here or there, but our yeah. focus is on the primary text. So that reminded yeah. me of the import of who I really am, a guy who really likes the primary text. And I had forgotten that a little bit for professional reasons, you know, um, and and also the audiences that I uh, that that I try to speak to and bridge these two universes of the social sciences and the humanities. But that re Arenas and working with you guys 
brought back the sense of comfort to my identity, the sort of coherence, because by example, because I was reading that in him, he really knew who he was. He really knew what he wanted out of literature, his aesthetics. And so that made me think about my own. So in that sense, I was changed, forever changing in response to this very interesting, you know, how it changes how I teach about him. Because even though I may, may or may not teach about him directly, his impetus, his spirit is there. And regaining that spirit was liberating to me in a moment that I that I felt like, oh my God, am I becoming like a social scientist exclusively, you know? But it, that returned me to the educational humanities. So thank you for that question because it allowed me to think about it. Yeah, and just going back to uh, Christine's question too about specific incidents or examples of pedagogy, pretty much every single thing that he wrote was an example of dissidence. Um, uh, when he was writing, homosexuality was illegal in Cuba, speaking out against the government was illegal, uh, and either directly or indirectly, every single one of his texts is speaking out, speaking to authority, against authority, criticizing uh, communist society, criticizing dictatorship. And again, this repetition, the seemingly relentless repetition of historical cycles that happen over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. So to say which one they all are, there, I, I think all of his works fall into that category. Yep. I don't know if we missed any other parts mm -hmm. of a question. Yes. What I like the best. Go ahead, Rafa. What I like the best of the work that we um, in this book is um, how we reread certain characters that were key his work, and one of those characters are the drag queens, and um, um, how extended th that figure of the drag queen as um, as someone who's having the same plight that transgender individuals have today. That was perhaps one of my most um, difficult tasks. And all of um, humor, um, one of the most difficult parts of writing this book, I tell him my uh, co-writers, I cannot work with um, Cecilia Valdez, I originally thought, because in the pandemic, I felt that it was a bad queer joke. And that's basically how I described it to, to them. And I was very, I was very sad because um, going back, we had already um, pre-planned book in terms of what we wanted to write about. And I was so much into Cecilia Valdez, not only because it's such an iconic Cuban book, but also because um, Reino uh, wrote this incredible um, parody of it, but I just couldn't do it. Maybe maybe I, I can go back to it, um, but back then, in the middle of that pandemic, I couldn't do it. Thank you all for the questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. I know that time is going, so probably we have to be saying goodbye right now, and I don't know if ER is coming to kind of close everything, I assume. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate very much your questions. And, you know, reach out uh, to us, you know, via email. And thanks for folks that we know that have been here. Thank you so much. for. Yes. Thank you. It's great Thank to have you, so you all. You know where to find them. It's so good to have you all here. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience and for your thoughtful questions. Um, the the University Press has given us a really kind deal. Um, so they've made the book available for a limited time just for viewers of this event at a discounted rate so that it's a bit more affordable at non-institutional prices. So if you um, click this teal button at the bottom center of the screen, um, that is the discounted price. It'll be available until Monday uh, morning. So, or really till midnight Sunday um, related to this event only. So uh, if you would like to buy it at a discounted rate, still not um, super cheap to be totally honest, but it is a great deal from the press and, um, you know, University presses mostly make their money from selling to institutions, which is why their books are more expensive. Um, they do not have 
you know, universal distribution. So they've done a really kind thing by doing this. So if you would like to purchase one or would like to encourage a library that you're affiliated with to purchase one, we would love that. Um, of course, if you are a uh, academic librarian that has buying power, you can also purchase it at full price from the press, which helps them even more. Um, but if you would like to purchase it today for your own reading library, um, we would love for you to purchase it from Keras because it really does help us as well. So um, thank you to all of you, Angie, Sandro, and of course, Rafa. Um, it's been a delight to host you and uh, to learn about this important work. So thank you. Thank you. And I hope that you stay safe and well, and um, that perhaps we can host you in person uh, in the future. Thank you so much. We look forward to it. Yes. Thank you all. Have a great Thank weekend, you. everybody. <laughs> Have a great one. Thank you guys Thank you. for listening and being here. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, audience. Thank you, friends.